Good morning, Community Life Church. Today we'll be reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Our ushers will be coming down the middle aisles with Bibles as well. If you do not have a Bible or know someone who needs one, please take one home with you today. That's our gift to you. If you do have one of the Bibles that the ushers just handed out, we'll be reading today from page 785. Here's the word of our Lord. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And as he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just are so thankful for the grace that you give us, Lord, and and the grace that led us here this morning. We pray that you would be over Pastor Matthew, Lord, as he opens up God's word, and that you would open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to receive it and use it uh, in weeks and in the years and all of our lives, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may have a seat. So today's kind of a fun day. If, you, if this is your first time, you picked a good Sunday to be here because we're starting a brand new sermon series um, looking at the gospel of Mark. Uh, we're starting at chapter 1, verse 1, as Keith just read, and What we're doing is we're going to go slowly through the book of Mark. We'll probably be in and out of Mark all of this year. I'm probably even into some of next year. Uh, And so that's kind of fun. And even in in verse 1 of today's text, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you uh, were wondering, why do they call some books of the Bible the Gospels, and some of them are books? Well, gospel means good news. That's literally what it means. And so this is the, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Just some context about the book of Mark. It is written by a guy named John Mark. um, And likely, even though he was not one of the original 12 disciples, um, he was influenced and given all this information from Peter. Uh, Peter, who was one of the apostles who followed Jesus. And so he is compiling all this information um, to give to people as like, hey, here's what you need to know about Jesus. Uh, and, And what's kind of fun is Mark... Uh, it, though it's the shortest of the Gospels, of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, it was likely the first one that was finished. So all the other Gospels were likely um, used Mark's as a template for how to get that done. So that's kind of fun. But this whole book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, um, is all about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so what I'm most excited about as we go through this sermon series through Mark is that I want you to get to know the person and character of Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we can intellectually understand that Jesus was a man. I think we can intellectually understand that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he did all these wondrous things. But I wonder sometimes if we forget that there's a real nature of Jesus Christ, that is that he is a man. He is a, uh, was a human being. And so what's fun is that Mark doesn't uh, do a lot of the genealogies. Mark doesn't do a lot of this fun intros. He's kind of like jumps right in. He's getting right in there talking about, hey, this is what happened when Jesus was baptized. Um, And the reason he does that, and you'll see this a lot in Mark, is that he uses the word immediately more than any other book in the Bible. He'll say, Jesus was doing this, and immediately he did this thing. Immediately he did this thing. Um, That's because Mark is writing this to people like you and me. Uh, John Mark was likely writing this for the people of Rome to the Romans, and they were a people not unlike Americans who were like, hey, give, just give us the information, man. Uh, we appreciate a good run-up, but just give us, give us what happened. Tell us the story. Um, and so that's what he's doing. He's writing to people uh, like you and me to bear witness about who Jesus is and what he has done. And so I want to keep going here. Look at verse 2 and 3 with me. It says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, 
Now, if you're following along in your um, Bible or on your e-Bible, you might see that it looks a little different. It's kind of like their normal block text, but this one's kind of center uh, aligned there. That's because it's quoting something in the Old Testament. Uh, and it says in, that it was said in Isaiah, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Verse 3 says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Mark includes this. Um, this is a reference to Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 4.3, or 40, verse 3. Uh, the reason that I, I bring that up to you to tell you that is that um, we have a God who loves to call his shot. Uh, he, we have a God who loves to say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And then it's so cool when we get to see it happen. This is a very good example of that, that uh, previously God had called his shot that he was going to send somebody before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus. And we now know that that's John the Baptist. But throughout all of our Bible, God has continually used people to proclaim what he is going to do. Practically before the Gospels in the Old Testament, um, he uses prophets to proclaim what he's going to do and about what the word of God says. The prophets would speak to the people on behalf of God. And we see today that he planned, pre-planned before Jesus was even born to use John to proclaim Jesus before Jesus even came. And here's what I have to tell you, Community Life Church, is that he desires to use us in the same way, to continue to point to Jesus and his gospel, his good news. You might be thinking, well, hold on, Matthew. You're the preacher. Uh, I'm not a preacher. Maybe I, I'm a teacher. I'm a plumber. I'm a, whatever your occupation is. I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm not the one who's supposed to be preaching the gospel. That's you. But actually, that's not true. If you look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, it says this. And he, that he is Jesus, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body. Now, I am a member of Community Life Church, um, just like many of you are. And so, in some ways, I am to have my own ministry as well. I am to be, go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ with non believing people. I am to, uh, I aim to serve this church and be in discipleship in this church and give to this church. And I do all that as a member of this church. But when I stand up here to preach to you, I do so as the preacher, as the teacher. But my goal up here is to equip you, the saints, and if you, are, if you believe in Jesus, if you've repented of your sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. And so when I stand up here, it's my goal to equip you for the work of ministry. That word ministry is kind of fun for me. Uh, I was a combat medic in the army uh, in a previous life, uh, over 10 years ago now. Uh, so when I think of the word ministry, it comes to the word minister, and when I think of the word minister, I think of the word administer. Uh, like you, maybe you get a shot and you, you get administered medicine. Uh, our goal and our job as saints of Jesus Christ, as those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, is to administer the gospel in every facet of our life. That we're going around just giving people the medicine of Jesus Christ and his good news, which is Jesus in my place for my sins. And so understand that it is all of our jobs to continue the legacy that God has established of using ordinary people to proclaim his good news. That is our job. If you've ever wondered, how did the gospel get from Jerusalem in the first century to North Peoria in 2024? Well, it's because people owned the mission. They, they took ordinary people and they continued to use the gifts that God had given them to administer the gospel to people. And that happened, and they kept doing that, and kept doing that, and we got the gospel here in North Peoria in 2024. So with all that in mind, here's my big idea for the day. God empowers ordinary people who have been redeemed to reveal his glory. God empowers ordinary people. You might think to yourself, I'm nothing extraordinary. Maybe I'd affirm that in you. You're not that extraordinary. But luckily, God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. That God typically uses those who have been redeemed by his grace and goodness to reveal his glory and power. So throughout the Bible, we see this, that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And today, we get to look at John the Baptist. Now that's different than John who wrote the Gospel of John. That was a different John. This is John the Baptist. We get to hear about him. 
But we're only looking at John the Baptist only as a further example of how God desires to use us. The same way he used John, he desires to use us. But we're just doing it from different points on the timeline. John was pointing forward to the day that Jesus would start his ministry, and we're just on the other side of Jesus pointing back at Jesus. But typically it's the the same way that God used John, he desires to use us. And so let's dive in looking at John the Baptist. Look at verse 4 with me. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Well, we're starting to get an idea of John the Baptist. But there's some things contextually that Maybe you knew, maybe you didn't know. Where John was baptizing these people in the Jordan would have been away from the city. And so they would have had to go out into the wilderness. And typically you did not want to be out in the wilderness. There was nothing out in the wilderness that you would want uh, to be a part of. But these people are having to take this step to go out into the wilderness, go to the river, hear John preach, and then be baptized. And you might be thinking, man, that's kind of a crazy thing to do. Um, Even when we baptize people here at Community Life Church, that's a bold thing to start doing, is to, to come up here, read your testimony, and then get baptized in front of your peers. That's a big step. And they did all of that because a guy wearing camel's hair and a leather belt eating locusts and honey told them to. Now that's crazy. Uh, I don't know about y'all, I haven't eaten any bugs recently that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't do that. But here's, what I, here's my first point. Your character is the loudest message people will hear. Mm, Let that sink in for a second. Your character is the loudest message people will hear. We've already established that we are to take the message of Jesus Christ and give it away. We've established that already. But understand, before we ever open our mouths to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people we know, they've already heard the message we believe by the way we conduct ourselves. So let's look at, just real quick, the character of John. Well, first and foremost, John is a guy who goes against the norms of society that disalign with God's will. Practically, John wore the attire of the prophet Elijah. Now, you don't need to know a lot about Elijah to understand this, but Elijah was a prophet who called for national repentance and turning towards God. And so he's wearing the, kind of the same attire that Elijah wore. He has, the di- he has a unique diet. Um, totally, if you're thinking, well, was that normal contextually for him to eat locusts and honey? No, it was just as weird then as it is now, just so we're all clear. If you find yourself like, well, it says in the Bible, John ate locusts, I think I might grab a grasshopper. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. But the, what he's doing is he actually took a Nazarite vow, and you could read up on this in the Old Testament, but um, he never touched dead bodies, he, didn't, um, he never cut his hair, he had a special diet. Um, He did all these things because he was trying to purify himself to be ready to proclaim the good news of Jesus. If you remember the story of Jesus' birth, if if you've ever got to hear that, uh, at the time that Mary is told that she is going to have uh, the Son of God, and she's going to deliver him, and he will be called Jesus, before that, her cousin Elizabeth finds out she's pregnant at an old age. The Bible says she was past childbearing age. Yet she conceived, and that this baby was going to be blessed and would prepare the way for the Messiah, which is Jesus. That was John the Baptist. So John knew at an early age it was his job to prepare the way for Jesus. So he did things a little differently because he wanted to live out for Jesus. He's going to go against the norms of his society because he wants to live out for Jesus. Another characteristic of John is that he is humble. John may be one of the most humble people in the Bible. In fact, when Jesus talks about John the Baptist, he says there are none greater in all the world than John the Baptist. That is a compliment. I mean, to say of all the people in the Old Testament, John is the best among them. Part of that is because of his humility. When talking about Jesus, when we heard Keith read the scripture for today, there's a part coming up where John says, listen, there's a guy who's coming who I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. And when Jesus will come later and ask John to baptize him, um, in, in Matthew, the book of Matthew, he says, no, 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 Jesus, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. 
He just always sees that, God, I'm not worthy of that. In almost every story about John the Baptist, you can see him not looking for what can be done for himself, but what can be done for the kingdom of God. Humility. And there are so many more characteristics of John that we could look at, but what I want you to see is that people would have known the kind of man that John the Baptist was. The kind of man who he was long before they ever heard his message. Ever, before they ever would have heard him open his mouth and proclaim true things, they would have heard about the kind of man that John the Baptist is. So that brings me to my, to my next idea in this. What does our character say about the kind of person we are? Especially if we've repented of our sins, we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we ought to look different than the rest of the world. Practically, when the Holy Spirit invades, when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we should look differently. Galatians 5 says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now that's a heavy thing, because if you read that list of the things about the flesh, you might see, well, I'm kind of prone to some fits of anger. If you drive on the 101 at rush hour, you're prone to fits of anger. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it's true. Maybe you're prone to jealousy or enmity or strife. And that does not mean that when it says you, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, what that's saying is that people who are characterized by being these kind of people are not the kind of people who have had their lives changed by the gospel. And so we have to ask ourselves, does our character reflect that we have the works of the flesh or the work of the Spirit? I'll tell you, uh, when I joined the Army, my first duty station was at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, and I loved it. I was with the 3rd Infantry Division. That probably doesn't mean anything to you, but it means a heck of a lot to me. Um, but I was with the infantry for that all that time, but um, I did not enjoy Georgia summers. I don't enjoy taking a shower and then going outside and feeling like I need to shower again because the humidity is so thick. And so when I was deployed, Tracy and I talked about it, and, and I re-enlisted. I gave, said, they told the Army, I'll give you four more years, but I need to go to Colorado. And they said, all right, you can go to Colorado. So we re-enlisted to go to Colorado. And at this time, I was a, an, an E-4, which was a specialist. Um, but I had gone to the promotion board, and so I was called specialist promotable. Uh, it just means as soon as my points, which all your achievements equate to some kind of points, once my points reached a certain level, I would be promoted to sergeant. So when I got to Colorado, at Fort Carson, Colorado, I was specialist promotable Mueller. Uh, and so I was kind of happy about that, obviously. That's kind of a fun thing. Um, the difference between me and other E4s is that like, I would have been mildly higher ranking than them. But when I got to my new duty station, there was a bunch of other specialists, but they weren't promotable. One of them in particular, his name was Jeff Miller. Um, and I, I met these guys, and much like you see today, I was the same in the Army. I was overjoyed about life. Uh, I didn't mind staying late to do Army things. I didn't mind running and doing push-ups. In fact, I kind of enjoyed all of those things. And so I was a little bit obnoxious to the people around me. They were like, this guy. <laughs> Jeff Miller and I would later become friends, but today one of my favorite compliments I've ever been given is that when Jeff went home after the first day of meeting me, or first week of meeting me, he goes home and tells his wife, he says, oh yeah, we got this new guy, specialist promotable Mueller. But I think that dude's a Christian because he's happy all the time. In that moment, I was proud of the fact that my character could reveal that maybe there was something different about me that Jesus had given me. I wonder, can people tell by looking at your life, man, there's something different about them. They have something in their character that points to something so much bigger than this world. Because, let me say it in a kind of an inflammatory way, it's not a win if someone is shocked to learn that you are a Christian. That's not a win. 
Like, oh, really? You are a Christian? That's not a win. That's not a win. I like it when I'm like, yeah, I'm a pastor. That people are like, yeah, we know. Like, we know. Our lives and our character should have been a reflection of our inward heart change already. When you tell somebody you're a Christian, they should be like, that that makes sense. That checks out. And people are typically sorters of things. We like to kind of sort people into different categories. You got the people who are Broncos fans, and you got the people who are wrong. And you got the people who, you know, like football and people who don't care and wish I'd stop doing Broncos analogies. Um, But we do this with people. We sort people into kind of people. So I wonder if you were to think about the people in your life, what kind of person do you think other people see you as? But I also want to kind of like let you off the hook a little bit. There's some of you who might be thinking, well, Matthew, if you knew my past, there's people who know me from before I knew Jesus. There's no way they're going to think that I'm a Christian. And I don't want you to see your past as a disqualification to, to proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. That's not true. Oftentimes, those who have a checkered past have a powerful testimony of Jesus Christ because they get to say, hey, I was like this, but now I'm like this, and that's because of Jesus. So I just want to ask you, as we, th- as we kind of wrap up this idea of character, I want you to think of the areas where you have dominion in your life. For example, at home, your kids and your spouse, the loudest message they will hear about what you believe about Jesus is your character. There's all these awful jokes about being a pastor's kid, right? Because they see the pastor gets up there on stage and proclaims this message, and then he goes home and he's an entirely different person. Your kids know better than you Uh, than what you've said, what your character looks like about the gospel. Your spouse. The way you live your life will proclaim to your spouse what you believe about Jesus Christ. Practically, I know there are some people in this church who are married to unbelievers. And the best way that we could possibly lead them to Jesus is by living out the character of Jesus in our lives. There's a Bible verse that talks about women who are married to unbelievers that says, love them in such a way that it will love them to repentance. What a powerful thing. What about at work? Can the guy down in finance, and we know the guy down in finance is weird. We know that. But can the guy down in finance know that you are a believer by the way you conduct yourself? By the conversations you do and do not participate in, can they say, hey, there's something different about them? What about in the community, at school drop-off, on the golf course, or at a potluck? Can people tell that you have had your life turned upside down and inside out by the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Because our character is the loudest message anyone will hear before you ever try to share the gospel with them. So that's the character of John. Let's let's keep going. In verse 7 it says this. And he preached, so this is what he said, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. My next point is this. Your message is to be all about Jesus. Your message is to be all about Jesus. Now, you might be thinking, well, that makes sense. Matthew, that's kind of self-explanatory. But this is kind of a radical message in our time. There's a lot of people who desire things other than just Jesus. Practically, if we look at John... Him telling these Jews to repent and be baptized is a crazy idea. Because only Gentiles got baptized. When they wanted to turn from their Gentile ways and become part of the Jewish tradition, they got baptized. Yet John was baptizing a bunch of people. Historians believe that over 300,000 people were baptized by John the Baptist. That's a crazy amount. Yet John's message convinced them and convicted them that they should. So what was it about John's message that like got all these Jews to say, no, I'm going to do this thing that's only reserved for Gentiles. I'm going to be baptized for the repentance of my sins. I'm going to confess my sins. I'm going to get baptized. Well, it's because John's message was filled with equal parts of law and grace. And when we proclaim our message, it is to have both law and grace. Repentance is a phrase that means to turn away from. When we are turning away from the areas where we have disobeyed God's law. 
And we need the grace that says that when we turn from our sins and put our faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. That's grace. We recognize we are unworthy because we fall short when it comes to the law of God. But when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we know that we are covered in the grace of Jesus Christ. It needs to be both. Practically, God's law condemned them in their sin and called them to repentance. But repentance alone would not save them. They must have the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ, God's grace, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So John's message was all about repent and be baptized. Well, why on earth would they do that? Well, Jesus. Because Jesus was coming. In the law, you have been disobedient. But praise be to God that he gave the grace of Jesus Christ coming to make the things that are wrong in this world right. Our message is to be all about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. John cared so much more about Jesus and his message than anything else. There comes a time later on, we'll get to it, when Jesus is starting to rise in popularity. John was very popular. And there comes a point when Jesus' popularity starts to outshine John. And there's a kind of man who goes, hey, what's going on? I need my ministry too. Yet this is what John says in John 3. It says, you yourselves bear me witness that I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has a bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. This idea of proclaiming Jesus Christ as our message means more than anything. It's about making Jesus known. There's not an award at Community Life for the person who baptizes the most people. That's not a thing. We give Jesus all the glory for that. We want Jesus to become a bigger presence in the life of our community and in, in our families. It's all about Jesus. So when we think about our message, because we have already covered, we are to be the ones going out, messengers of Jesus Christ. It's not really about us. It's to be about the kingdom of God. Remember, the saints are to minister the word. As opposed to saying, hey, I'm not a preacher, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not the guy, I'm not gifted like that. No, we're all called to minister the gospel. Another place in Ephesians tells us that it's because when we do that as the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known. It's not that we get the credit, but that we can be used for the glory of God. If you've been around for a while, maybe you've um, seen me do the three circles training where I, I talk about a way to share the gospel using three circles. But even in the three circles, we really prioritize law and grace, making it all about Jesus, that God created the world and it was good. The first circle is God's design, that everything was good, but somehow we got to the second circle, which is brokenness. I mean, how do we get there? Well, that was sin. Brokenness was brought on by sin, which is the law. But then we get to the third circle, which is the gospel, which here at Community Life, we say the gospel is Jesus in my place for my sins. And when we repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are free to recover and pursue God's design for our life. It ends up being this big circle. That when we have the grace and mercy God has given to us, we can boldly live for God because our disobedience has been canceled out and our standing before God has been restored. Now we can pursue the life that he has for us. That is the simplified version of our message, Jesus in my place for my sins. But let me tell you what our message is not. Our message is totally to be about the person and work of Jesus Christ. The gospel message isn't even, I get to go to heaven when I die. You know, there used to be these big campaigns that said, um, do you know where you're going when you die? And it was this idea that if you don't know Jesus, um, you will spend eternity separated from God, which we call hell. But the idea of repenting and putting our faith in Jesus Christ isn't so that we can be in heaven. It's not so that, oh good, I got away, for, got away with it. The goal isn't heaven just for enjoyment's sake. The goal is heaven because our relationship with God allows us back into the presence of God that we might worship him and bask in his glory. The goal is Jesus. The message of the gospel isn't believe and everything will be better. There is a false gospel out there that says you need Jesus so you can be healthy, wealthy, and thriving. And that's not true. We talked about it last week that following Jesus will oftentimes be uncomfortable. The gospel message isn't a guarantee to a more successful life this side of heaven. 
not true. And it's not a solution to all of the problems of your life. If you are not a believer today, and I know not everybody in here is a Christian. I'm not naive to think that everybody who comes to community life is a Christian, but I'm glad that you come. Practically, if you were to repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus today, the same problems you walked in with are the same problems you're going home with, except for the biggest problem, which is what do I do about my sin? So our gospel message is not, I get to go to heaven, or that everything will be better, or the solution to my problems. The gospel message is, Jesus in my place for my sin means that I have my relationship with him restored. I don't know what will happen in this life, but I know where I stand with God. That is our message. It goes on to say the bap- that in verse 9, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Here's my third point. Jesus' identity empowers you to go. Jesus' identity empowers you to go. It's kind of an, a funny idea, Jesus being baptized. When people get baptized here at Community Life, they, they say, I was once lost in my sin, but Jesus Christ, and now I am different. All the people who were getting baptized when Jesus was there that day had repented of their sins. But Jesus lived a perfect life. He had no sins to repent of. So why did he need to be baptized? Jesus gets baptized to take on the personhood and the nature of man. I heard a beautiful uh, illustration. This is all figurative. This is not literal. Don't, Don't hold me to like this is my systematic theology on the subject. But when practically, figuratively, when we get in the water to be baptized, it's like our sins are being washed away. If you've ever done dishes where you uh, plug up the sink and you get soapy water, you start washing the dishes. The dishes come out clean, but the water is left dirty. You can imagine, it's like going in with dirty clothes, and after you get baptized, you come out with white clothes. Practically, Jesus goes in with clean dishes or a clean outfit. He gets in the water and takes on our filth, takes on our sin. By getting baptized, Jesus is getting ready to take on the sins of the world and then to go have them nailed to the cross to take punishment for our sin. Jesus is submitting himself to the Father's will, saying, I know what I've come here for. I'm going to take on the nature of a man and then be killed as a man for the sins of the world. And when he does that, this is probably one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. Because if you can imagine being there that day, Jesus comes up out of the water and God decides to crack open heaven. He rips open heaven. It says it rips open heaven and proclaims, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In that statement, we see three things about Jesus' identity. First, he is my son. God literally says, that man right there is my son. The second thing he says is that he is beloved. That means he is loved. Not just like, ooh, I love you, man, but like, I love my son. And the third thing he says is that he is pleasing. I am well pleased with him. But do you know, praise be to God that he said those things about Jesus because it tells us something about us. Because when we repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we get to put on his identity. We get to be called his son. Look at Romans 8 with me real quick. It says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That means because of Jesus Christ in my place for my sins, what's said of Jesus gets to be said of me. What Jesus is to inherit, I am to inherit. How Jesus stands before God is how I get to stand before God. Which means that if you are a Christian, you have a good heavenly father. I don't know what your relationship was like with your earthly father. Maybe that was good, maybe that was bad. But regardless of what you had on earth, You have a good heavenly father now who has adopted you into his family and says, that is my son, that is my daughter. That is a powerful thing. But that also means that we are beloved. Do you remember the cliche wedding? It says, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. That is saying, hey, those who are loved by God. And know this, 
whether you are a believer or not, you are so loved by God. That is why Jesus came, is because it said, for God so loved the world, so loved you, that he sent his son to die in our place for our sins. It's the whole reason why Jesus came, is because you are loved. But when we repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus, we're so loved that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf before God. Another place in Romans 8, it says that when we pray and we don't know how, the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. Because we're loved. We're so loved that Hebrews tells us that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Did you ever get in trouble as a kid and then you kind of didn't want to go see your parents afterwards? We don't have that. We're so loved that even when we got it dead wrong, we get to go to our Heavenly Father and say, I I messed up. And he says, you are my son or you are my daughter and I love you. That's a powerful thing. And then the third thing is that we are pleasing. I bet you if I were to have conversations with you, that's an uncomfortable feeling. Hey, do you know that you are accepting to God? That you are pleasing to God? Some of us have really low self-worth. Maybe, maybe you're somebody who self-deprecates a lot. You don't think much of yourself. Well, understand this, that in Jesus Christ, God thinks a lot of you. You may think, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Yeah, Jesus thought you were to die for, literally. When you think that you have no worth, understand this, God thinks that you have a lot of worth. In Jesus Christ, you are pleasing to him. So in this identity, in Jesus' identity of being beloved, and being his son, and being well-pleasing to God, in light of this identity, we can go. We can boldly glow. Go, not glow. You don't ever get to glow. That's not a thing that happens. If you're glowing, go to the hospital. Um, But we can boldly go. I've used this illustration before, but I want to use it again. If I asked you to walk across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope, you would probably say, you're crazy. No way, not doing it, can't do it. I said, okay, that's true, it would be really hard. But if I said, hey, there's going to be a safety net underneath you, that even if you fall off, you'll be caught, you'll be totally safe, and not only that, you'll get to get back on the tightrope right where you left off and keep going. Well, if you knew you were safe, you'd at least try it. Well, some of you probably wouldn't. I would. If I was tied to a rope or something, like, yeah, I'll I'll give it a shot. In the same way, when I tell you, hey, you need to go boldly live for Jesus Christ, proclaim his gospel. Let other people know about him. Administer the gospel in the circles that you operate in. You might be thinking, Matt, that's impossible. Maybe. But knowing that you are caught in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, you can boldly try. Because if you fail, guess what? You are still a child of God, you are still loved by God, and you are still pleasing to God. So you might as well give it a shot. So what? I give you this message, but you're left with the question, so what? Let me first start by saying that if you are not a believer, your so what is repent and be baptized. You know that you've fallen short. You know that you have not been a perfect person. And you likely understand that the consequences of that before God are great. But if you will repent of those, if you will turn from them and follow Jesus Christ through baptism, you will be saved. The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, if if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So if you're not a believer, I'm going to invite you, repent and be baptized. But if you are, if you are a Christian, I want you to boldly live your life for Christ. Because as ordinary as it may seem that you are, and you may very well be, God has a history of using ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things in his name. God will use people like a nursery leader to help shape the foundation of kids' lives so that they grow up knowing Jesus. My prayer, I got the privilege to pray for the nursery team today. My prayer was that those kids would grow up not remembering a day that they did not know Jesus Christ. How is that going to happen when ordinary people decide to live boldly for God? I want you to allow yourself to live boldly for Christ, allowing your character to reflect the grace that you've been given and the Holy Spirit at work in you. I want you to boldly live for Christ. And when you're able to declare the gospel of Jesus, Jesus in my place for my sins, and invite other people to repent and follow him, to boldly live and rest in the fact that when you are in Christ, you are loved 
You are his, and you are pleasing to him. With that truth, there is nothing that we cannot do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for this, this truthful message, God, that the grace that we bask in, the hope that we bask in, was not given to us so that we could just merely enjoy it, but so that we could continue to give it away. God, you have a plan to use us to make yourself known. God, I pray for everybody in here that they would leave here with the simple truth of knowing that they are loved by you. And if they would repent of their sins, put their faith in you, God, they are accepted by you, and that you adopt them into their family, that you say, sit at my dining room table, eat with me, you are part of my family. God, some people come from broken families. Some people are in the middle of tragedy and chaos. And God, I pray that they would know that they are loved, they are accepted, and that they are yours. If there's somebody in here who does not yet know that, can't say that, God, I pray you'd bring them to the end of themselves, that they'd be able to admit, oh, I'm totally broken. But Jesus, I know you died in my place for my sins, and I want to follow you. If they'll do that, God, you'll adopt them into your family today. God, maybe Community Life Church be a place filled with people who boldly live for you, not thinking that they won't fail, but knowing that when they do fail, they're caught in your grace and your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.